Welcome back to the table. Ryan and I just played Village Rails from Osprey Games, uh, and I have to admit, I was reluctant to play this because I thought it was a train game. I mean, what, it's called Village Rails. There's it, a picture of a train on the cover. And technically, I mean, sir, son of, some of you who've played it out there are going, well, David, it is a train game. But it's not the kind of train game that I thought it was going to be. For some reason, I had it in my mind that this was like some sort of like little box experience to give people something along the lines of a taste of 18xx, right. which is not at right. all. I mean, it is a train game with trains and the theme is trains and building lines of track. It's not what you would expect to find in a train game. There's no stock market. There's no uh, production of your tracks. There's no pickup and deliver mechanic. There's no connecting cities. Like... The kind of thing that when you say it's a train game, you would expect to find are not there. No, and, it's, and, and it, I don't think they've sold it that way. That was probably my misunderstanding well, that it was a When you a look at the cover, game. even like it's got this old school Euro-y artwork that would probably be on the cover of one that of those true. other styles it was, it was of the train pic, games. It was the box art. It was the name. Um, I mean, Ticket to Ride is a train game, too. I would say Ticket to Ride is even more of a train game than Yeah, that. so let's just get yeah, This theme yeah. could have been anything. Really, many, thi many things, anyway. All you're really doing is drafting cards, and you're drafting them into a 3x4 grid, 12 cards, and you're just connecting these lines. They could have been roads. They could have been circuits on a circuit board. Yeah. I like that they chose trains. Yeah. It makes the it makes the theme come through. It's very easy to grasp the way that these train lines interact with each other. And it just makes for a really pretty looking map tableau when you're done playing all 12 of your cards. Yeah, it's really interesting. Those 12 cards that are gonna go to the inside are these cards here out that are one side of each card. The other side of all those cards are, what do they call these again? They're called trip cards. Trip cards. The trip cards are another type of card you could take on your turn because on your turn, you're always gonna take one of these sort of terrain cards. Then you may, or even beforehand, take one of the trip cards. The trip cards are gonna go on the outside and potentially give you more scoring for that line when it scores. And that's one of the interesting things about the game is there is some end of game scoring, but each line is gonna score when it's completed. And a line is from either the left of the board off to either the right or the bottom, or from the top of the board off the right or the bottom. And I say that because there are some track cards that have sort of basically an intersection and then some that have a couple turns and i could play one card literally that finishes oh yeah you could line. you could have a card come straight down just a curve right off the start and just end it immediately yeah. but each of these cards has different scoring conditions on them each of those trip cards has different scoring conditions on them so really your goal is not to do that your goal no. is to maximize the points of each line by making it maybe stretch out as far as possible because these aren't just straight across or straight up and down. You can weave them so that you can potentially get more cards. But what's neat about the game and the puzzle part that I didn't really comprehend at first was that if you're focusing on one line and you're like, oh, this is making a really juicy path, you're kind of determining the path that other lines are going to take yeah. by the other pieces of track that are on each card because each card has you know, all the sides. So it's gonna fit in the grid no matter where you place it. It will always fit and it will always make sure that your track line can continue. But I myself found my, in, in a position where I placed a few cards that meant I had to place a card where my track scored zero points. Yeah. That and was unfortunate. But unfortunate, but I think it's also part of the game. It's like sort of seizing a big opportunity, score some big points on one line. Maybe you're sacrificing some others making sure to keep an eye out for some of these trip cards so that you can edge out a few more points on some of the lines. But it is definitely a puzzle game through and through. And Ryan mentioned those different scoring opportunities. When you finish a line, you're going to basically just follow along the track and score several different icons. And each of those icons score a little bit differently. Oh, or a lot differently in some cases. Well, sure, sure. <laughs> and on top of that, scoring those other uh, trip cards. After you've scored a line, you're going to remove a trip card if you had one there, and then you're going to play, be able to play a Terminus card. Now, this is an interesting aspect because the Terminus cards don't score you any points, mm -hmm. but they're going to track a lot of the same icons that we were just talking about for scoring as it relates to earning money. So I have one here that is a number of point scoring icons. So there's just some icons that just score you points. And depending on if I have... Uh, zero, one, two, or three or more of those icons on a line when I close it, 
I earn money instantly. What's money good for? Well, it does convert to points three to one at the end of the game, but more importantly, you spend it during the game when you're drafting these cards because you can always take the rightmost card for mm -hmm. free or the rightmost trip card for three coins. But as you go to the left, you have to place a coin on every card that you don't take, like many other games that I'm sure you've seen. So you are going to be spending some coins throughout the game to get some things done. Well, a lot of times, because having those coins and being able to buy cards is very powerful, because a lot of what is being tracked, a lot of these icons are reflecting the different terrain types that you're going to see in each yeah. one of these cards. Every card is in one particular terrain type. There's five different terrain types possible. And so when you're making your line, some of these trip cards are saying, well, you're going to get six points if every piece of terrain on that track is the same, or if it's all different. Or you might have a barn on your track that scores fields. It says this barn gives you one point for every field on the track. And if you can put multiple field barns on a track with multiple fields, it starts to really, really add up in points. And so all of that is the puzzle. But again, it's so important that you're not just looking at one piece of track on that card. Oh, for sure. Because if you're doing some grain, because I want my line that goes across to be a grain, maybe the one that's going down can't have a grain in it to score its point card. So you start to realize that you've kind of trapped yourself, which is why being able to look down that line and buy other cards becomes so important. Yeah, and when you look down that line, you're going to want to look for basically the perfect puzzle piece. Yeah. You know, like we said, this is a puzzle. You're looking at a puzzle in front of you and you have to consider a number of variables. And then you're basically looking out like, oh, which is the perfect piece for the puzzle I'm yeah. building? And if it's way over here to the left, you might have to need, you know, you're yeah, gonna need some I, money. I, I it. did that a couple times. You did. However, I think that it might was, have bit you. It did bite me ultimately in in our game that David and I played. I lost, and I, part of the reason I lost was because David hoarded all of his coins. Was, was very frugal. Also, you were very frugal about. I was spending I, coins to buy cards. I ended up with forty five dollars, <laughs> which converted to fifteen extra points, I mean, which was just enough. Well. It was in there that I actually edged out the win. Yeah, and I was spending a lot to try to always get the perfect card, which means I'm leaving coins on these cards as I go by. And as you take those cards, you're getting all the yeah. coins that I left. Plus, if you're buying these trip cards on top, the ones that score your victory points, they cost three alone. So I was blowing through my money pretty quickly. I probably would have benefited from maybe not spending so much. Yeah, at first when I first started playing, I thought those trip cards were going to be something I wanted on every line. But really, at least for me in my play, I decided, uh, you know what, I'm just going to finish this line without a trip card for sure. Because maybe it was, you just do simple math. You know, if a trip card's worth four points and you're going to have to spend more than effectively four points right. to get that card, don't do it or well, do do it. And you, you do kind of end up in this situation where if you put a trip card on a line, there could be two things that happen. Either you put the trip card early and then that kind of constricts you. Yeah. You're like, I want to make sure to fulfill this trip card. You can get lucky and see a trip card and look down and go, oh, well, I've already got this completed. I'm just going to take this trip yeah. card. But that's that's more rare. A lot of times you'll get into a situation where placing one line can fulfill one trip card, but then disqualify the other. And so I, I think like just loading up on trip cards early could be a problem. It's kind of like one of those things where you're probably only going to play maybe three or four trip cards across your seven lines. Maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe more. It depends on your strategy. I want to get more games under my belt before I determine that. But yeah, you're going to look at those and think, ah, oh, I want them. But then after you play, you might have taken far fewer than you thought. So yeah. in terms of who this is for, who's it not for, I'm going to say uh, in terms of who it's for, this is for anyone who loves a puzzle game. Like if you think you don't like railroad games, just put that out of your head and give this a try because this is a really satisfying puzzle game. This is, again, falls into, it's two to four players, right? Yep. Um, but it falls into that category of like really great feeling two player game. I totally see this being a two players over coffee, Sunday morning sort of game. Not a big footprint. It's really just your play space and then yeah, the, yeah. two rows of cards yep. from this deck. Um, so if you like puzzle games, and even if you think you don't like train games, you give this a try because the puzzle is very, very satisfying. Anything where there's a puzzle with like X number of different scoring routes oh, yeah. is always very fun to sort of like navigate between those things. Who it's not for. So I would say this is not for people that are expecting or like more of that train game experience, which is funny given yeah. the title of the game, but you're not doing what you're the things you're doing in a lot of different train games. You're not wor worried about completing routes. You're not doing that pick up and deliver. There's not that heavy element of, you know, trying to maximize 
uh, stock and bonds and, and taking, you know, loans and just like stuff that you'd expect to find. Sure. Uh, it's This is not like, you know, mini Age of Steam, right? This is a very abstract puzzle game, like David said. So I think if you're a train gamer and you like games that, you know, challenge you in that way, this game pushes a lot of different buttons as, as far as that the way that the puzzle works. It's not about maximizing your lines. There's no engines. There's no nothing like that. You're not paying to build track. You don't even just have to worry cards. about finishing your lines. Yeah. Everyone's going to finish your line. The, the way the cards are, they're not terribly complex. They're either like this or they're two turns in opposing corners. So they're always going to work. You're never going to have a card that's like, oh, I can't make this work. It just goes in into the space. So after 12 rounds, once everyone has 12 cards, that's the end of the game. Yeah. So if you're looking for, you know, something with Age of Steam vibes or 18xx vibes, this has none of that. Right. But it is still a very challenging, satisfying puzzle, I would say. Yeah, it's very good. If you have any questions about it, if you want to know a little bit more, like, is this really for me? Well, first of all, I think it is. <laughs> you should give it a try. I mean, it's a 45-minute game, am, and the rules, it's like two pages of rules. It's very so. fast. I'm super glad I tried it today. I'm glad Ryan kind of forced us on it. I was <laughs> like, oh, wow, that's really good. I'm going to want to play it again. Yeah. But like I said, if you have any questions, make them in the comments below. And of course, until next time, make sure everyone has fun at the table. And we'll see you then.